Our next is produce safety. Yay, we're very excited about that. We have Christina Banks, who um, is the produce safety specialist with the Office of Dairy and Foods with VDEX. Christina, yes. Yes. take it away. So uh, I do work with the Office of Dairy and Foods. I work with Pam. Pam is my manager. And I'm just going to tell you guys, I'm learning a lot here on this program today. I sat at the beginning and there are things I still don't know about the program. I worked with the state for about 15 years in a couple of different departments and with VDAPs in this, in this position for about four and a half years. And I'll just tell you, I, I'm learning every day. And some of the things we will talk about today as I start to share my screen is some of the changes that we, we do talk about. You know, um, every day it's changing. And I will today talk to you about a new change that we are seeing. Um, let's see if I can get me get my slideshow here to open as we talk. Does everybody see that? Good. Okay. So some of the things I am going to share with you are what an inspection looks like, what we do out in the field. Um, that's one of my main jobs. I say is an inspector as a as the produce rule. Um, we're going to find out, you know, is your farm covered, what that looks like, you know, if you're under an exempt rule, and also share you some valuable information and give you some information about the FDA water update. I'm going to move my annotation. Okay. So just to start out, what we're looking at here, it's, it's a map of our territories. We right now currently, there's two inspectors in the state, so we have quite a large territory. In the summer months, we're busy covering these, these territories, these counties. If you right now, I currently reside in Carroll County. I'm the purple territory. And Kenny, if you guys have dealt with Kenny at any of your meetings, that's Kenny Payne, and he is in the pink. We are currently, I think, gonna be getting a go ahead to possibly put a person in the yellow. Oh, not sure about that. I'm just gonna say, but we are covering that area right now with, with calls and as best we can cover. So as I just jump right in, um, just want to tell you about the Food Safety Modernization Act. Again, I think some of you guys might have heard me. I said, we are a little bit different. We fall underneath of the FDA we, that was passed into Congress in 2010. It was a law signed in January 4th, 2011. You know, that's part of the 21 CFR Part 112. Um, Really, what it, we are our own ruling. VDAX works underneath their own ruling, but FDA implements that produce safety rule as well. So, although again we work under FDA's authority, but we all we have state authority to perform the inspections that we do. So we started doing our large inspections in 2019 in Virginia. Those large cover farms were over the five hundred thousand dollar growth sales. Some of you, if you're selling at farmers markets, you may not have seen us in 2019. The six key requirements of a produce safety rule are ag water, biological soil amendments, sprouts, domesticated wild animals, worker training, equipment tools. Really, our goal is to educate farmers while we regulate and again, voluntary compliance with the produce safety law. Kind of minus my little screen there. So what part is not covered by the rule when you hear it's, am I covered or am I not covered? Some examples would be like tomatoes processed for tomato paste because that produce receives a commercial processing that adequately would reduce the presence of microorganisms. Another one would be like produce grown for individual personal consumption. So if you have a small strawberry patch and you eat that and it's just for your consumption for your family or produce that's consumed raw. FDA has an exhaustive list that you can we can get you a resource and show you online. There's also a little um, handout chart that they have listed with all of these on here. I'm not going to go through them, but it's going to be it's called a rack. It's called um, a rarely oh I said it's not a rarely consumed raw um, list. It's actually called a raw ag culture commodity. And so this whole entire list is going to be here. Um, and again, if you. you if you're on this list and say it's pumpkins, you only it has to be only this product. It's a bit confusing, but you have to be only growing one of these products. If you're growing maybe pumpkins and possibly tomatoes, then you could possibly be covered. We'll talk about that in just a second. Will every produce farm in Virginia need to be inspected? 
Well, produce inspections, they are mandatory for any covered farm operation that grows harvest packs produce under the rule. Sprout inspections are conducted by FDA VDACs. Again, that, that three-year gross sales average and threshold increase in, with inflation. So there's a link here, and I'm not going to go through this link right here, but there's a link put in here, and, and we're going to maybe drop that in the chat, or we can get that to you afterwards. But that link, what that is going to tell you is what that inflation amount looks like. There's three year, it says, you know, and it will drop down to the next tool, which I'm going to show you the picture of. There's a decision tree that's going to allow you to go through and help you go through as a produce grower and say, how much do I make? What, what commodity do I grow? Um, over, it, I think it starts now, it's like a $29,000. I think our old decision tree might say like 28. But the decision tree looks like this. Again, you can go with that, that, that link that I put in the chat. It's going to be on there. And that's that one that was up there. And it looks like, does my grow, my farm grow, cover, grow, harvest, pack, or whole produce? So it would help you ask the questions is like, no. Um, your answer would be like, no. My, you know, whatever it is that you would go through this decision tree and say, like, does your farm on an annual, Excuse me, I'm going to try to, I'm trying to read this from the screen and trying to read it from the paper at the same time. I'm not doing very well. But what it does is it helps you decide whether you are covered from the rule or not. But we don't just leave this on you on your own. We will also help you. You can also reach out to your extension agent. But this is just going to be the basic tool that's going to help you decide if you're covered by what commodity you grow again and what um, dollar amount you make. That gets to be a little sticky. And like, again, that's going to be able to something we can help you. Um, also, there's a qualified exemption that you can apply for, you know, but if you do apply for that qualified exemption, you do have to keep records that you're performing that annual review of your verification of your farm's continued eligibility for the exemption. The records have to demonstrate that your farm satisfies and that criteria for that qualified exemption. And then it just shows, I mean, the majority of your food sales to a qualified end users and you have to have data receipts. So I want to talk more about that in just a minute and tell you how you can apply for that qualified exemption. But I want to now really quickly just tell you what's the difference between an inspection and a gap audit because we've been having some of these questions. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'm just going to tell you the basics of it. So the produce safety inspection, what I'm talking about now, it is mandatory if you are a covered farm. A gap audit is not, it's a voluntary audit. And then there's fees associated with a gap audit and there's none with an inspection. State FDA inspector conducts that FISMA PSR inspection, the one that I'm explaining to you now. And a USDA um, personnel conducts that gap audit. There's a food safety plan that's required for a gap audit. They do both require record keeping. And there's a really nice handout that you can follow the link that we can get you that link as well. It's about a six or seven page document that AFTO put out maybe a year or so ago. And it goes through exactly what I'm you know, going into detail about what the difference is between that gap audit. It's really, it's really nice information to have. Um, again, some of the education and the training that is, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm closing all the spots on my screen, but some of the education and training that is required for you to have on your farm is if you're a covered farm, you do have to have one of the, like kind of like a restaurant, you have to have somebody who has a supervisor on the farm that has completed a standardized food safety training program. So it's a little bit like that restaurant or the health department. You have to have somebody training. And that training is the Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training Course. PSA is who that puts that on. There's also one if you have sprouts. Hmm. Let me see. I don't know how it's much. Okay, there we go. Um, there's there is an education tr and training coming up. They are doing those virtually. Virginia Tech and VC and VCE has partnered with us, and currently that course is offered for only twenty five dollars per person. Without the grant funding, it's like one hundred and fifty two hundred dollars a person. Right now, it is through Zoom, or they have them self paced. There's no in person offered at the time. And the next offering is 28th of this month. It's two four-hour half days. I'm not sure if the class is full or not. Um, 
right now, the best way to do it, you know, to reach out is to Dr. Laura Strong and her email is on there. If you want to capture this screen or take a picture of this screen, but it's two half days, one to five. So this is right now the required training. If you feel like you need to have that, if you think that your form is covered, this will be the required training you have to have. Our inspections, we just want to talk about our inspections really quick and what our inspections started at. I, I told you they started in 2019. Our main commodities that we saw were tomatoes, leafy greens, cucumbers, peppers, apples, cantaloupe, and cabbage. Then inspections of the small cover farms. Now that was the farms that were smaller, the $250,000. Those that's farms up to $250,000 in gross sales. They began in June 5th, 2020. And then of the very small farms was $29,000 to $250,000. They were made first to, to, to 2021. So it's a total date. We've done 96 inspections last year. Some of the observations we see, just pretty basic ones like record keeping not being in zone, like a supervisor signature missing, maybe pest control just not being adequate. The other one that we see quite a bit is just not having that training that we're saying, that PSA training or just the employee is not having training. There is some things that you can have done if you do think that you're covered by the rule. This um, it's an on-farm readiness review. It really is for growers who are covered and qualified exempts, but you can also have this on-farm readiness review if you, you know, wanna have an extension agent come out, contact your local extension agent. You can also contact our office, you know, through the vaprodusafety.com. But the main goal really is to help small and very small farmers aware of this law and to kind of help them go through what an inspection will look like. And what the inspection looks like in the beginning, we would come out to your farm. Um, you know, even before that, we will give you a call. We try to make sure that you are under an inspection or, you know, before we come out, we don't want to come out to an inspection or, you know, a farm that's exempt. Um, again, this is a federally funded program, so there's no fee for us to come out. And if you are to be inspected, then we'll set up a date, a time, and then we will usually do the inspection when you're harvesting. We like to see some product harvesting during your season. And then all inspections, at the, we were doing educational inspections in the beginning and up until this past year, March 18th, 2023. After that, there'll be no more educational first inspections as we're being told. So what that really just means is just a change. Again, we talked about changes being, you know, happening. This was an FDA change and just saying, you know, now we have to just count all inspections as visits and just a normal inspection. But again, um, you know, we're doing this as voluntary compliance. I really want to stress that. So um, the next step that we, we do is when we get there, we just want to ensure that all employee records are filled out correctly, like the employee training, the cleaning and sanitizing. If you do have biological soil amendments that you're using, that you have the records for that. The ag water assessment, we'll talk about that at the end. The existing records, if you have any other audits that you are using, like what I was talking about, if you are gap inspected, then you can use those audits. Electronic and handwritten records are definitely allowed. And then the most general records, you know, they must be cut for at least two years. The, again, the records must be signed and initialed by the person performing the task, include the date, the farm name, be reviewed and signed with the date and supervisor. So on that day that we come, we would ask to speak to the owner or the person in charge. We would ask to see some activities like growing and harvesting and packing. We always, you know, we, we can't always see things for the whole farm. It's if we're capturing the whole season of the farm and just the little snapshot of a couple hours. So this will help the inspector decide where to start when we ask kind of like, what are you doing today? We also need to see, observe like farm operations, like, um, like again, like I said, things you can't see during the, during the inspection. You may be growing five or six different things and maybe harvesting only one thing when we're there. And that's okay. We just would like to kind of ask, how do you harvest that, that product? You can anticipate questions like the training, the employee health and hygiene, animal management. And then we'll take some notes and review the records before we leave. Um, also, if you have any regulatory findings, which we we often um, would definitely go over with you and you know, often give you chances to fix whatever we do find, fix it in the field, any corrections made to you. 
during the inspection will just be documented on the report. And then the way that an inspection works for a produce safety inspection, it's not a percentage, like a gap, you know, you, get a, you have to get 80% to pass. With a produce safety inspection, it's really like, are you in compliance? Are you out of compliance? So that's really how it is. It's, you get like a little checkbox of an observation. And then at the end, we have you sign the inspection report and we're able to print that inspection report off and leave it with you right in the field or we can email it to you. This is what an inspection report looks like. It's pretty basic. And again, like I was telling you, you get like these observations if you want to you know, check. Um, you don't necessarily get a certificate of like an inspection. You just get this um, observation and inspection report. This is pictures of some different farms we see. This is just um, some of this past season, you know, like we've got pepper farms and, and cabbage. We see a lot of cabbage up in Southwest Virginia and a lot of different orchards. I see different greenhouses, lots of different homemade greenhouses and microgreens are becoming a large operation. And there's a hydroponics with the tomatoes to see quite a bit of, quite a bit of hydroponics happening. Oh. So I go too far. No. So this has got a lot of information on it. I'm just going to share with you um, on a smaller version here. All right. So VDAX has launched a new online portal to assist the farmers. And remember, I told you I was going to go back and tell you how you can apply for an exemption and apply for a qualified exemption. You guys may have heard about this new portal. It, it, launched last summer and we're just now really sharing some information about it. But this this online produce safety grower portal really what it is is it's a registration information center to obtain educational data. And in this system that has been created, you're able to print a certificate of registration. You can register your farm. And again, you don't have to be inspected to go there and print off a form of registration. All of you guys here listening today, if you're a farm and you have grow produce, you all have the accessibility to go on there and register your farm free, no charge. And with that, when you do, you can grow, you can get automatically signed up and locked into the Virginia Grown system. Um, you may have to go further and, you know, they will, I just do know that you'll put you in their database. You will have the ability to print a registration certificate. So that may market look like your products locally. I'll show you in a second what that looks like. You will have to be able to apply for an exemption. So if you are underneath that $29,000 threshold and you are selling gross sales, and then you would be able to apply for that exemption. Otherwise, we don't know if you're underneath that exemption. I mean, we, Kenny and I, two people, we just gonna, we're just going to think that we're supposed to inspect you. So honestly, the best way for us and I don't say this, I say this in, with, the, with all due respect, but the best way, if you think that you're exempt, is go on here and go through that chart and follow it, you know, that exemption chart and follow it and find out, well, yeah, I'm exempt. So follow it, print off your exemption, and then you would also receive up-to-date produce safety information about that, for instance, that class. You'll get information about the educational and training resources. You'll get periodic newsletters and also about like the FDA water update. Like we don't have the um the office staff to be emailing everybody all of these updates so this is a perfectly good spot to do this i just encourage you with more than anything to you know go on here lastly um the qualified exemption we're no longer allowed to accept these qualified exemption forms in the field so i, I can't accept them anymore we used to take them go visit you we would drive around showing up at people's farms unexpected and getting you to fill out these on, I mean, qualified exemption forms, we would spend 50% of our time in the winter, you know, trying to get you to fill these forms out. Again, the qualified exemptions for farmers that are still in $28,000 up to $500,000 if you're selling to like a local market, if you're selling underneath the 50% wholesale. And I'm not gonna go through all of those that's gonna help you on that decision tree because I have a lot more information to share with you, but, that's where this portal looks like. You may have got this in the mail. Um, this is what our postcard looked like. Everything I said that we were just talking about is kind of on the back of this postcard. You know, just talking about receiving the information. Um, we're, we have a link. We'll have a link to this produce safety VDAX registration site here. Again, there's no charge. 
when you do get to the portal, you will go here and you would just click that apply online button and then you will be able to search for your farm name. If it's not in there, you just enter it new, you use your username. I give, you get a password, kind of looks like this. You go through this whole entire little system of uh, putting your information in, um, the primary point of contact. Again, this is so you can, you can A, register and or at the end, you're gonna apply for your safety exemption. This is what your certificate will look like. So this is gonna be really nice for your farmer's market managers to know that you're complying with what VDAX has asked you to do is if you're selling produce. Be also a nice way for farmer, farmers market managers to say, well, I know that so ABC Farm has done what they're supposed to do. And because they're either they're they're either A, have their they can show me they've been inspected, or B, they have this um, exemption, which is right here, this certificate of exemption saying that they're exempt and they're qualified exempt and they don't have to do that. So it's just a really quick way that it can take off some work for a lot of us. It could take off work for maybe even the market managers for doing, and I'm not saying it's gonna take the place of doing the visits, but however, you guys can use this tool to say we are complying. And um, farmers, you know, it's, it is a little bit one more step, but farmers also know that, you know, all of this is out there for you to use and you can go through that decision tree and you're gonna be the one deciding, am I exempt or not? You know, with help of us, we can definitely help you. I'm gonna jump into the ag water. Ag water is um, gonna be affecting all growers and consumers in a sense. And all growers, if you are over $500,000 in gross sales. So there's a lot of information here, but I just wanna to touch on it because you guys may not be there yet. I hope one day you are. Um, and you won't, you won't have to be, you can just, be these large farms, and but I hope one day, but there is a place for farmers markets and one day it will jump down to the very small businesses. So with further ado, I'm gonna jump in. This is the compliance state for harvest and post water agriculture water. And I'm on the lower half of the slide because the top half of the slide has not come out yet. FDA has been working on water rules for four or five years and they're still waiting for that pre-harvest water, meaning you're, I'll show you some differences in just a quick minute. But right now we're talking about water that we use on the farm for harvesting and post-harvest. And they made a ruling of January 26th for all farms, other businesses, and we're gonna call that large farms. So all gross farms, gross sales of $500,000 or greater. So it's large farms. So if you notice um, the 2024 next year, is gonna be small farms, it's gonna be 250,000. 2025 is going to be for very small farms, and that number is going to be 29,000 to 250,000. So that may affect you guys in three years. Who's covered? All farms covered who are conducting covered activities on covered produce using ag water during harvest and harvest activities. That word covered is the word that we're focusing on. These slides are from an FDA presentation. So just meaning if you're covered farm, not qualified exempt and not exempt. If we're inspecting you, you're covered. So you'll you'll know if you're covered. They're just the easy word. So the pre-harvest one is where that we're not focusing on, but I like to look at the slide because it just helps us understand pre-harvest is overhead sprinklers, spray, surface water, furrow, flood, seepage, pesticide. Those waters are water you're using before your harvest. So that's pre-harvest. Remember, FDA has not made a ruling. Maybe about a year. I'm just gonna guess about a year, year and a half. But right now, post-harvest is dump tanks, flumes, cooling water, wash water, et cetera, means like any water that's touching food surface, food or food surfaces. And that's gonna be, um, if you're washing apples, if you're washing your spinach, if you're washing any produce. And this, this year, remember, just that those are the large farms. And if you are a large farm and you're washing produce and you're, you're using that water, what are the requirements per FDA? The first one is just saying that you have to have that safe, adequate microbial count of water. That means that you cannot have any detectable generic E. coli. That's going to be like your basic Bactese test, like presence and absence test. It's not your like um, your parts per million. This is like your basic one, VDAX. We can test it. The lab can test it or approved lab source. Our website has the approved lab sources on there too. 
And during the season, you have to have untreated groundwater must be tested four times per year initially. And then one time per year, if meeting no detectable E. coli. We just had a meeting last week and I was told that if you're already testing your water supply, then it meets regulations. Like you don't have to do extra tests for the Department of Agriculture. So that is one new requirement. The other new requirement is that you have to inspect your water system. Like if you have a well or um, whatever your water system may be, I'm just gonna say well in Southwest Virginia, you just have to inspect your water system just to make sure it's not broken. If you were having some problems, you would have to document your corrective measures. I'm just going to go a little bit quicker through this section because you guys, and it doesn't, none of this may apply. And if it does, you ask me questions at the end. Um, if you are treating your water, if you're having any washed water, I'm just going to use apples for an example. If you're washing apples and in in maybe like an um, apple flume and uh, you, you're monitoring that water, maybe you're putting chlorine in that water to wash and you need to, this, this says you have to, have a safe, adequate use of that treatment. And that has to be like the EPA label. And you have to see section like 11246. And that's the code that you have to see. And it's just saying you do have to monitor that. And then water samples, it does say that anybody can take water samples. That's nice. I'm like, anybody can take a water sample. It doesn't have to be a lab. Um, you can take it. It just needs to be taken aseptically. And the records that shall be kept in addition to a couple of the other records that need to be kept for party safety is you just have to keep your inspection maintenance. If you were using public water supply, you would need to keep a certificate of compliance and then your testing. The last three or four are just like things that you use in scientific support to treat your water. Like I want to skip over those. And how is the FDA asking BDACs to inspect this year. This is new for us, it's new for you guys. They're asking us to take an educational approach and I appreciate that. I appreciate that they're asking us to educate why we regulate because you know, you know, farms need, um, I feel like farms still need you know help. We still need to like work with farmers and I think that's what BDACs is really good about. I think that they have always been able to work with the growers and I think that's what we'll continue to do. And so this year, was, as we go out to the farms and work with the new water rule, we're gonna be allowing to take that educational approach. So that's one thing that I appreciate with that. The, there is a really great fact sheet that um, FDA just came out with. It is the second one on here. It's the harvest and post-harvest water sheet. It just came out in January. And pretty much all of what I said and then some is on there. Um, there's a water assessment builder that you can go on and play around if you're interested in. That is for the pre-harvest. It's in Spanish and you can also print it, but it's 33 pages. I went print it. That's a lot. So in summary, just start thinking about like how you can conduct a water assessment that you could use the FDA tool. Think about the water assessment and determine some hazards or risk if you have them. And then also, you know, in addition, if you're not doing an annual water system inspection, Maybe you start doing that. Just start kind of looking at your water supply. You know, start keeping records. PSA, Purdue Safety Alliance, works really closely with us. And they are already in the process, and if not done, of creating a book for that, for the records for you to keep. So that's really great. When we show up to an inspection, I bring you records and logs. I mean, I know we're inspector, but we also bring you, we, we try to help you. You know, we bring those records with you, with you or with us. So that's going to be something that they're going to give hand out as those records for you to keep. If you're using municipal, again, keep, keep a copy of that record. If you're using untreated groundwater, four samples initially, untreated surface water must not be used. So that's been something that a lot of that's new. You know, that's that's not that's not necessarily um, that's that's a hard one to, that we're working with. So because of the high microbial profiles, separate requirements when used in pre harvest, and that's going to be coming. So that's, this cannot be used as wash water. There's our web page and everything that I said, that we have um, all those links to all the information that I've shared with you. And it's on our virginiaproducesafety.com and all of those risk assessments, the builders, the list of the testing sites, the rock cards, the compliance dates are all on our website. Hey, do you have any questions? 
We do. We have a bunch of questions in the chat, and I know we're um, pretty much out of time. Let me ask you a couple, and then I'll ask if you could hop on and answer some. And then if you're able to come back at like 3.45, and yeah. if I just hop on. But um, somebody asked about the uh, spotted lanternfly, and I'm just trying to find it now. I was answering someone else's question. Um, is there, can you discuss the spotted lanternfly inspection permit? Is that still required? Um, it, it is required. I would, I would share that. I mean, put that off to the extension agent. I just know for instance, I don't want to give any wrong information, but I know for instance, for Carroll County, like we're in a zone that we have to have that inspection. Like I live in Carroll. So I know that you have to have a class and then get also an inspection. And I don't want to give out any bad or wrong information, but I'm only the ones of the classes myself. So okay. I definitely know that you you do need to, in, if you're in that area, you know, of where it's like, like Carroll County, where it's an infested area. I don't even know if I'm saying the right word, but I do know that like there's certain, you cannot remove produce without that inspection. So I know Carroll is one of them. Okay. And, I, and your, yeah, your extension agent will be able to directly answer it. So what is it? Thank you. What is a covered farm and what is GAP? Okay, so um, GAP is Good Agriculture Power Practices, and GAP is under USDA's guidance. So um, that is not even under our department. And GAP is kind of what I showed that difference in that first, maybe third or fourth slide about like kind of what's the difference. And GAP is a voluntary inspection. And, you know, that, that um, there's a link and I can even put it in the chat, like when we get talking, there's a link and there's a really good document that APTO made and it tells you exactly the difference between like the produce safety rule and then the gap inspection. Um, covered farm is going to be a farm that's doing any, that is on that list of the produce that FDA says that is covered and it's going to be any agriculture commodity that's eaten that's not eaten raw so it, then it's also it makes a difference of how much money it is um if you're over the twenty nine thousand, so it starts to it, there's a lot of like little rules so cover pretty much mean am i over the twenty nine thousand? then can i possibly be not qualified exempt and then am i growing a crop that is not really consumed raw so that decision tree that is the standards for produce safety that I have a link in where it says covers and exemptions. Okay. Definitely you need to go, if you have, a, if you're growing produce, you need to go through that coverage and exemptions and it'll tell you you are a covered farm. By the time you get to the one page, you work through a little one page document and it's gonna say you're a covered farm or not covered farm. Okay, so we'll send that on next week. Okay, okay. and um, perfect. Does the three do the 360 courses qualify for the food safety training program for those who are farming um, that you were talking about? The only one that will qualify for the training is the Produce Safety Alliance course. Okay. There's a lot of them out there. I do know that, but as far as the one required from FDA, they that is the only one that they will allow us to recognize. Okay. And then um, the last one, and then I'll ask if you could hop on and pick up all of them at the bottom that I wasn't able to get to for the sake of our um, other presenters. Um, does the training requirement apply to West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland farms that sell their produce in Virginia? So the training requirement is if they sell it in different states? So their farm is based in Pennsylvania, and they sell it here in Virginia. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you sell it in, if you sell it here, that most definitely um, it would it would apply to it. But you can also use that training from because of the FDA. You know, it's a, it's a, it would be a federal um, training. You know, so it's it's the same recognized training throughout the, through the nation, actually. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. Really Instagram. Yeah, y'all, things have changed a lot, and I love the new website, so thank you very much. So I would like to uh, say a special thanks to all of our partners, again, the Virginia Department of Health, Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and the family, Virginia Family Nutrition Program, as well as the USDA, FMPP, Farm Credit, VSU College of Agriculture, Prince Charitable Trust, Virginia Fresh Match, and the Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers Trail, and Virginia's for Farmers Market Lovers. We thank you.